Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, you've kept us all this week, and we just want to say thank you. Lord, we thank you that you've just brought us so far, oh God. You've shown us grace. You've shown us mercy. You've allowed your Holy Spirit to indwell in these earthen vessels. And God, we just want to say thank you for that. But now, Lord, this is your time and this is your hour. We need a word from you, O oh God. For, Father, if we don't hear from you, Lord, what shall we do? So, Father, please let your word go forth. Let it fall afresh and a brand new on fertile soil. Help us, O oh God, to hear from you clearly. Now take your manservant, O oh God, and hide me behind the cross. Cause me to decrease that you may increase, that we may hear your voice, O oh God, that we may hear your words, and that we may adhere to them, follow them, that they may nourish us and grow us, O oh God, that you may be glorified and magnified by all we say and do. In the name of Jesus, O oh God, we pray this morning, and we all say amen. Good morning, Word First family. Amen. There's a word from the Lord this morning. If you have your Bibles this morning, thank you, Brother Clay, read portion of that for us. So I just want to put everything in context. So if you have your Bibles, if you would open them up to Matthew 20, Matthew 20, and we're going to read from verses 1 through 16, Matthew 20, Matthew 20. If you have it, say amen. If you don't, say, I need a smartphone. I need a smartphone. Matthew 20. If you're able to stand for the reading of the Word, please uh, do so, if you will, as we stand in reference for the Word of God. I'm going to read this morning from the New King James Version of the Bible. And it reads this way. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. And again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last first. And those who came were hired about the eleventh hour, that they each receive a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner. Put your pen right there. Saying that the last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the heat all day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish, if I wish to give this last man the same as to you, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye so evil because I am good? So the last will be first, and the first shall be last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Go back up to verse 11 and hear the voice of the Lord. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner. For a few moments with your prayers, I like to preach from the subject. Is that how you really feel? You may be seated in God's presence. Is that how you really feel? Church family, you know, one of the greatest joys of my life is being a dad. And, you know, when you have multiple kids, those of you who have more than one child, you can attest and you can testify, Bradley as well as April, you guys, since you have little bitty kids and everything, you can attest and you know that it's different when you have more than one child. Sister Rhonda, you can definitely testify because your children are grown at this point in time, but I'm sure that if you reflect back, you can remember exactly what it was like when they were 
when they were younger and when they were toddlers, you would tell one this thing and one another thing, and the first thing they would always say to you, or you can actually look back and think about one of the favorite phrases that they would always give you is, Mama or Daddy, that's not fair. Maybe you told one of them to go to bed early, and the other one, they could stay up late, and they would say, Mama or Daddy, that's not fair. Have you ever been there? Have you ever heard somebody say, Mama, that's not fair. Daddy, that's not fair. You let him stay up late and I had to go to bed. That's not fair. You made, you gave them an extra helping of dessert and you didn't give me one. That's not fair. It seems like we are all built or it's in, innate, innately within us that there is a sense of fairness. Have you ever been working on your job and somebody got promoted over you? Maybe they were lazy. Maybe they barely showed up, but now they're getting all these kudos and accolades and you have slayed, you have worked hard, you have put your best foot forward only to find out that now life seems to be unfair. Have you ever been there? Do you know what that's like? Can you articulate that? We all have a sense of what fairness looks like in our lives. And if you find yourself in that space and in that situation, you know where these 6 a.m. workers are. They've been working all day. They've been born the heat of the day only to find out at the end of the day, the landowner comes to them and he pays them the same wage that he pays those that only worked one hour. And they really want to utter, they really want to shout, they really want to go off and say, that's not fair. I've done all of this. I've given you my best and you're going to pay them the same way you pay me. That's not fair. Have we all been there before? Do you know what that's like to know that life seemingly is just not fair sometimes? And if we find ourselves like that in the ministry, don't we? In the church, don't we? Where it seems like sometimes God just isn't fair. If God is no respecter of persons, if he forgives all of my sins, if he doesn't hold my transgressions against me, then I would expect that when the blessings come that he would give me the same that he gives somebody else. But sometimes he allows me to go through things that he spared them from, and I just want to utter sometimes, God, that's not fair. Because we all get like that. Have you ever wondered why he called your, your spouse home and left the other person there? Have you ever wondered why he let this person get sick and yet and still this other person is still kicking it and going through it? Have you ever wondered why sometimes it feels like the wicked do prosper and the righteous go through hell? Sometimes you just want to holler, God, that's not fair. I've done all I can to serve you. I've done all I can to be right. I come to church on time. I go to Bible study. I pay my tithes. I don't cuss folk out the way I used to or even the way they deserve. But yet and still, when I'm trying to do right by you, it seems like I find myself struggling. God, that ain't fair. And it's always a brother or sister that's down the street that seem like they got it going on. He ain't never been to Bible study, don't know what it's like to go to church, ain't opened his Bible since he failed Sunday school. But every time you turn around, he got a new car in the driveway, a new, ch a new check in the mail, a new boo in the bed, and God, that ain't fair. Have you ever been there and you wanted to ask God why? It seems like life just ain't fair. And before you get too sanctified and too holy and spiritual on me, let me go ahead and be the first one to tell you that we all can get there. That we all got a testimony what we've seemingly seen and wanted to ask God at one point or another, God, why is all this happening to me? If you're God the way you say you are, then why do I struggle? If you're God the way you say you are, then why am I going through all this hell and high water? If you're the God that I think you are, then why is all this happening? By now, God, things should have changed. By now, God, things should have gotten better. By now, God, you should have let my ship come in. By now, God, something should have changed in my situation. Well, if you're right there, then you understand what these six o'clock workers are. Notice, if you will, we look at this parable of the landowner, and one of the first things you want to understand, for me, you know that when I look at text of Scripture, I always want to make sure that I got it in context. 
So one of the things you find out is like, well, why did Jesus give this parable in the first place? So you need to rewind a little bit just to figure out what's going on, what's the context, what's the background, so you don't miss the breakdown. What precedes this landowner and this vineyard? Why does Jesus begin to teach this lesson to the disciples about us having and serving an unfair God? Oh, and just in case, so I can go ahead on and give you the end of the movie before we even get to it. Yes, we do serve an unfair God. Oh, I love that. And Jesus begins to teach them disciples about this. But before he even gets there, notice what happens, if you will. If we rewind, if we rewind just a little bit, we find out that there's this rich young ruler. He steps up to Jesus and he puts in an application and he says, Gee, I want to be a disciple. Jay, I want to follow you. I want to give my life for you. I want to serve you. I've been in church all my life, and now I'm ready to do the dang on thing. Now I'm ready to be sold out for you. What do I need to do to be a disciple, Jesus? Jesus says, you got to do a few things. Number one, you need to learn to keep the law. Honor your mother and father. Do this and do that. The young ruler claps back at him and says, hey, Jesus, I've done that from my youth. I follow the law. I go to church. I do everything I can. I take care of my mother and father. I've done all of that. And remember, this is a rich young ruler, y'all. He has money. He has means. He has nice church clothes. He keeps the law. He was probably a member of Word First at one point in time. He would probably fit in right with word first, but then he says, what do I need to do to really get my discipleship rolling? Jesus says, sell everything and follow me. First of all, he was like, keeping the law, I got that. Loving my mother and father, taking care of them, I got that. Jesus says, one thing you lack, sell everything and follow me. That brother said, you talking to me, G? You sell everything? I ain't there yet, Jesus. He exits stage left. He says, no, thank you. He catches out. First question for you is, what is it in your life that you're not willing to surrender to God? What area in your life are you not willing to give over and sell out for Jesus Christ? Maybe it's not your money, maybe it's your time, maybe it's not your time, but maybe it's just your witness. What is it that you refuse to turn over to God? Because truth be told, we all have an area of our life that Jesus is not privy to. We all have an area in our lives that we really don't want God to have control over. What is it in your life this morning that you refuse to release and give over to a holy God? This brother said that he wasn't ready to give up all his money, so he dips. But Peter, in great grand and glorious fashion, he is looking and listening from the outside in. He is ear hustling, if you will. He's watching how all of this goes down with Jesus and the rich young ruler. So Peter, after the rich young ruler leaves, he comes to Jesus and says, Hey, Jesus, we ain't like him. We've given up everything for you. We've given up our fishing business. We've given up our families. We've given up our reputation. We followed you, Jesus. What do we get? What's in it for us? What's in it for me at this point? Because I've given up everything unlike him. And Jesus says, well, Pete, I got a little story for you. You want to know what's in it for you? He gives him that Calhoun tombs, you know, where my Living Color fans at. You know the Calhoun tunes? Wrote a little song for you. You want to hear it? Here it go. Jesus says, I got a little story for you. You want to hear it? Here it go. He says, Pete, there was a landowner. And this landowner, and customary, and it was in that day that he had his land that he needed to have work. He needed to have this vineyard work. So he went out early in the morning to the marketplace to find some laborers. You know, you find the laborers. If you go to Home Depot early in the morning, you'll see the laborers up there on the corner waiting for somebody to pick them up. He finds these laborers at the Home Depot and he begins to talk with them and let them know that he has a job for them. When he tells them that he has a job for them, they begin to bargain and to hassle. They begin to come to a, an agreement with, they begin to come to an agreement on the price of what they're really going to do. 
They, the Greek word here for bargain, the Greek word here for agreement is this Greek word symphoneo. Already you should hear the word symphony. Bradley will tell you that a symphony is a collective agreement between vocals and instrumentals where the vocals and the instrumentals come together in agreement and when sequence that when one would do this, the other would do that, it is a collective agreement. Symphoneo is what it is. So they symphoneo, they agree on a price. They come together in agreement on a denarius for a whole day's work. I will give you one denarius for 12 hours worth of work. They agree on it, 6 a.m. crew, they go into the vineyard and they begin to work. While they're in the vineyard and they begin to work at 6 a.m., the landowner goes back out again at 9 o'clock in the morning. First question that comes to mind at this point, Brother Long, why, why did he go back out there? What, what made the brother go back out at 9 o'clock? He just hired at 6 o'clock in the morning. Was it the fact that the 6 a.m. crew was inadequate? Could it be that they weren't doing what they needed to do? Or could it be that he just needed more because his land was so big or could it be, is it even possible that he went out there and hired more because he could? Because we serve a God that's so big that he makes decisions not based on what you do, but just because he can. He goes back out there at six, he goes out there at six, he goes back at nine simply because he can. And he hires more. But notice, if you will, in the text, the Bible says he goes back out at 9 o'clock and he hires. There's no symphonio. There's no bargaining. There's no agreement. He just says, go work in the vineyard and I'll pay you what's right. No bargaining. I'll take care of you. He goes back out again at noon, does the same thing. Y'all go work in the vineyard and I'll pay you what's right. He does the same thing at 3 o'clock. And then, unbeknownst, he goes back again at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And he says, y'all still been standing here all day? What's going on? And the people say, ain't nobody chose us. Everybody done looked over us. Everybody done rolled us, looked past us. They looked through us, and nobody's chosen us. The man says, go in my vineyard, work, and I'll pay you what's right. I love that. Hear the text. There's no agreement. There's no bargaining. The man just says, go into the vineyard, do what you need to do, and I'll pay you what's right. Ain't that something like a man, the landowner with God? God just says, come to me as you are. Go in and do what you're supposed to do, and I'll do what's right by you. No expectations, but they're just trusting that the landowner would do right by them. Symphonio. They had a collective agreement that morning, but in the afternoon, those other ones, he distrusted the landowner that he was going to do right by him. Here it is, six o'clock, it's quitting time. The bell rings, and now it's time to get paid. The, rich, the landowner says, hey, pay everybody what we owe them. Start from the last all the way to the first and start paying everybody what we owe them. They line up in categories, and it's amazing that they line up with where they think they belong. The five o'clock is on this side. The 6 a.m. is on this side. The 6 a.m. begins to watch as the owner begins to pay everybody else out. The owner gets to the 5 a.m. crew, and he pays them a Daenerys for one hour of work. To their surprise, you got to admit, you got to must think about how they must be feeling at this point. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't do anything to merit it. But the man, the owner, God in his sovereignty gave you what you didn't deserve. He gave them a denarius, which is worth 12 hours worth of work, and they only worked one. Is there anybody in church this morning that's a representative or a recipient of God's grace? You got what you did not earn. You got what you did not work for you got what you didn't need but God in his grace he gave it to you anyhow he was a blessing and notice what happens 
They paid the five eight. They paid a five p.m. verse. A denarius. They're happy. They're going lucky. They're excited. They're ecstatic. And you got to admit, now the 6 a.m. crew, they over there seeing what he gave them. They're excited. If he gave them a denarius, when he gets to us, <laughs> bonus time. If he paid them a denarius, we finna get a bonus because we've been here all day. And notice what they do. They've been there all day. The ruler pays the 5 p.m., the 3 p.m., the noon, the 9, gets to the 6. They're excited. They got their hands out, and he gives them a denarius. All hell broke loose. They started tripping and they started talking, and before you know it, the first union in the Bible is formed. They send letters to the Department of Labor, EEOC. They begin to picket outside the landowner, and they got signs out there, and all their chanting is, that's not fair. That's not fair. That's not fair. How are you going to give them, or how are you going to give us the same amount you gave them? We've been here with you all day, thinking that they serve a fair God. Look, if you will, look at what happens with the crowd. They go up and they go off. They say, listen, we've been here all day. Our clothes are dirty. We got sweat all on our brow. We stink. We done suffered this heat. And this is all you got for us? I expect more from you. They not like the 5, the 5 p.m. crowd. They've only been out there an hour. The 5 p.m. crowd's only been there an hour. They still smell like dove and ivory. Ain't no sweat on their brow. They ain't really done too much of nothing. Sit around and watch. They feel some type of way. And is it possible that we're all like the 6 a.m. crowd sometimes? We can all get like that. So but before we move on, let me, just teach, let me just park here really quickly and just teach. When we hear this parable, we have to understand, and what I want you to understand, that parables are actually built on, the, built on allegories. And allegories are built on the literary devices where in that particular story, the story of an allegory is meant to represent people in real life. So when you hear an allegory or when someone's telling you an allegory, it is a story, but it is meant to represent the people in real life. So when Jesus tells this story to Peter, to, to Peter and them and the disciples, one of the things he's saying is, I want you to be, I want you to be able to identify with the people in the story. Therefore, I want to know, where do you see yourself in the story? And before y'all say it, because I know a few of y'all are big ballers and shot callers, the landowner is God. You can't be the landowner. So where do you see yourself in the story? Do you identify most with the 6 a.m. or do you identify most with the 5 p.m. crowd? And before you get super sanctified and spiritual and super satisfied, super sanctified, we all have some 6 a.m. in us because we all can look back over our lives and we all can know when things seem not fair. Yes, on the 5 p.m. side, it's nice to be able to proclaim that God has been gracious to us and God has been merciful to us, but at the end of the day, we all got some 6 a.m. in us. All I've sacrificed, and this is what I get, I've given you the best years of my life and it ended up in divorce. I've tried the best I can to raise you and instead of going to graduation, we go to rehab. I've done the best I can on this job and instead of them promoting me, they promote the person I trained. We all got some 6 a.m. in us where it seems like God and life just ain't fair. So what do we learn from this right here? What do we learn from this 6 p.m. crowd? What's wrong with them? Number one, they had a sense of entitlement. 
They have a sense of entitlement. They, they look at this and they decide that since we've been here all day, since we've been sold out, since we put in all this work, he ought to be obligated to give us a bonus. And that's one of the issues that we face in the church today, that when you come to Jesus Christ, so many people feel that God should be obligated to bless them, that God is obligated to do something for you based on what you've done for him. Oh, that's deep right there. Let me ask you, on your spiritual resume, what have you done for God that mandates that God do something extra for you? What is on your spiritual resume that you have that you can show to God that he can look at and say, you know what, I owe you something extra. What have you done that obligates God to do something extra for you? As a matter of fact, what, God, what can God do extra for you after he's already given you Jesus Christ? Ooh. All of us have moments when we holler that God isn't fair, that we, when we complain. The Bible says, and it hits, this is what that really gets me, in the text, when they receive their denarius, the 6 p.m. crowd, look at what they do when they receive their denarius. They got their hands out, they get their denarius, and they complain about it. And when they complain about it, they use this Greek word, gongatsu. Let the church say, gongatsu. They gone gatsu, and when they complain with gone gatsu, it doesn't mean that they complain in a loud voice. They complain in a small voice. Gone gatsu means you complain in a small voice. In other words, you hear it under the breath. All of you that have children, you know how it go. Clean up your room. I ain't gonna do nothing. What you say? Gone gatsu. They mumble under their breath, gone gatsu. Everyone has whispered gone gatsu at one point in time or another when God allowed you to go through something and he spared somebody else from it, gone gatsu. You complain, you murmur under your breath. And that's what they did. They complained under their breath. The nerve of him to pay us and pay them the same wage, something wrong with him. Child, I'd never work for him again. They say it under their breath. Have you ever been like that? Your supervisor doesn't give you the raise that you thought you should have got, and you complain under your breath. Gongatsu is when, it's, when, it, when you want to shout about it, but you can't because you want your neighbor to think you're real deep and spiritual. Gongatsu is when it's in your heart, but you can't get it out of your mouth. Gongatsu is when you feel it, but you're too sanctified to shout it because you don't want people to think that you and God ain't on the same page. So you say it under your breath. But look at what happens. They're complaining about it under their breath, but the master still heard it. You can talk about it all you want between you and the wall, between you and your spouse, between you and your friends, but guess what? God still hears about it. And if all you got are complaining about what God ain't done and what God is taking too long to do, God still hears it. When you can magnify your faults and the problems, when you can magnify and forget about the blessings, God still hears it. We spend so much time talking about what we ain't got and what God ain't did, we forget about the ways he's made. We forget about the valleys he's walked us through. We forget about how he dried some tears. We forget about the sleepless nights that he kept us together. We forget that when we lost a loved one, he held our minds together. We forget that when our child was sick, he saw us through it. We forget about the goodness and the blessings of God by focusing on the negative so often. And we gone God's. We complain. But the master heard it. And no, no, notice what happens when the master hears it. The master says, the master says, after he hears it, he says, he says, friend, am I not doing right by you, friend? Have I done wrong by you, friend? Mother Stella, watch this right here. This term friend 
is not a term of endearment. This term, Sister Rhonda, check this out. This term friend, if we were to look at it in African American colloquial linguistic language, uh, in other words, eubonic hood language, it's what we would do when we use the phrase little. When we as black people, when we put little in front of something, we're being nice, nasty. So, so, when, so when the landowner uses this phrase, uh, friend, he's being nice, nasty. Y'all know what nice, nasty is, right? So nice, nasty, once again, when you put little in front of anything, we're being nice, nasty. Uh, for example, uh, Brother Walter, uh, I see you over there with you and your little friends. <laughs> Look at you with your little job. Look at you with your little Chanel bag over there. You think you're something, don't you? Whenever we put little in front of something, we're being nice, nasty. And that's what the landowner is doing. He's being nice, nasty. I'm not doing wrong by you, friend. Take your money and go. And then he comes back with it and said, hey, don't I not have the right to do what I want to do with my own stuff? And maybe, just maybe, that that's what God says to all of us. When you start talking about how so-and-so got blessed, how you kept her, how you got her a new car, how you blessed her with a new husband, how you kept their lights on, and you forget what he's done for you, and God comes back and says, can I not do what I want with my own blessings? We forget sometimes. We, we come to God expecting and demanding and treating God like he's obligated to bless us. God doesn't have to do anything for us. He comes to you and he says, didn't I wake you up this morning? Didn't I keep you clothed in your right mind? Didn't I bless you? Didn't I hold your life together? And all you can focus on is what you ain't got. What's wrong with this 6 a.m. crowd? Number one, they have a sense of entitlement. Number two, they start comparing themselves to other people. The problem is, is how they started it out. They started it out with symphonio, an agreement. And now that the agreement has been met, they want to change the rules in midstream. Ain't it like that for the same thing with equality? that once we get things the way we need them to be and everybody's on the page, same page, they want to change the rules. I, I don't have a problem with you getting paid. The problem is, is when you get paid, the same amount that I get. You can get paid, you just can't get paid more than me. You can get promoted as long as you're not promoted over me. They have a sense of entitlement, but then they begin to compare themselves to somebody else. Brother Law must be living a great life and God must really be on his side because he drive a BMW and I'm in a Pinto. You don't know the cost it may be to have that BMW. We, 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 sometimes, we so often look at what everybody else is blessed with, we don't know the story behind the blessing. There's always a breaking behind the blessing you want the blessing, but you have no idea the breaking that he may have had to go through. They have a sense of entitlement. They feel obligated. They think that God should be obligated to do something for them because of what they thought they did for him. What is it that you think that you have really just done for God in the church or even in your own personal life? Now he owes you something. Well, God is obligated to do something for you. They're, they're, and, and the reason they think like this, here's why they think like this. In the olden days, when Jesus is telling this parable, in the Roman temple, they had a sign over all the Roman temples. And it was a sign that said, do a days, do a days, do a days. You do, I do because you do. I do because you do. In other words, if I do this, you'll do that. They had a frame of reference that said or that thought that if I do just this, you're going to automatically bless me and keep it on. Forget about the contract. We're going to change it up in midstream. But God doesn't operate like that. The landowner comes back and he tells him, he said, hey, didn't I do right by you? Didn't I keep up my end of the bargain, my end of the agreement? Don't you, you've forgotten already how generous I've been to you? 
how faithful I've been to you. That's the thing right there. The landowner has been faithful because even with me paying somebody else the same amount, I'm still faithful and I'm still keeping my word to you. Didn't we agree on that, Daenerys? Didn't we agree that you would do 12 hours work of work for one Daenerys? How am I doing you wrong, friend? I love that. God comes to you and says, you, you, we come to God and we say, well, God, you're obligated to do something more. God comes back to us and says, everything you're doing in the kingdom is what you signed up for. Is there anything in the church that you're doing that you haven't signed up for? Well, you know, I go to church every day. Well, you're supposed to go to church every, every Sunday. You're supposed to be in church. Don't forsake, don't forsake the assembly of yoking yourself together. Well, I forgive people that I don't even like. Well, you're supposed to forgive people because if you don't forgive them, then God won't forgive you. Everything you do, you signed up for. God is not asking you to do anything extra than what you signed up for. But when you feel that your work in the church, your work in the ministry has transcended the calling that God has placed on your life, now you feel that God is obligated to do something more. And there is a danger in that when you begin to expect and think God is obligated. Because when God doesn't come through on your obligation, you think God has broken the agreement. And when you think God has broken the agreement, you know what you'll do? You'll leave church. You'll stop serving. You'll stop witnessing. You'll stop coming to church. You'll stop testifying. Because church hurt will cause you to take a step back and say that this church thing ain't working. Because the obligations that you placed on God, and God ain't obligated to do nothing. Some folks come here thinking that they're, some folks come here thinking that they have a negotiation with God that they can negotiate with God in such a way that God is going to... Have you ever seen people that just negotiate? I, I used to be one of those people, uh, going, out to, going out late at night and stuff like that, and next thing you know, on uh, Saturday nights and on Sunday mornings, you're hanging over a toilet, Lord, if you just get me through this, I won't drink no more. Have you ever been there? You, you, you prayed it and you meant the prayer, and God stands back and says, I know you was lying when you made that prayer. Because the next week, where you at? Same place, doing the same old thing. But you want to negotiate with God again. The master's response is, you did what you signed up to do. Nothing you've done goes above or beyond what God is inclined to do. God doesn't look at your resume and think that, you had, that he owes you something. But here's the thing that really gets me here. Not only were they entitled, not only did they start comparing to other people, but they forgot about being grateful. Ooh, they forgot to be grateful for what God had already done. They forgot to be grateful for what the landowner had already done. They wanted something more, but the landowner said, you know what, I'm going to keep my word. You still got your denarius. You can praise me. You can thank God for it. You can just thank God that he kept his word. I still got my denarius. But they had so much ego comparing themselves to other people, they couldn't see the blessing in what God had already done. How often is it that any of us, we can look back over our lives and we don't even thank God for what he did yesterday? All we focus on is what he didn't do today, what we're still waiting on him to do tomorrow, and right now, God, you take it too long, you dragging your feet right now, and when you going to show up, when you going to show out, when my ship going to come in, God, when will you move? And God looks back and tells you, I've already done this before. Don't you remember when I brought you out of your sickness? Don't you remember when I took care of your baby? Don't you remember when I took care of your mother? God says, you need to learn to trust the process. Don't give up on God because he ain't answering you fast enough. Look, 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 at, look, 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 look at what happens right here. Look at what happens. I, I just got to get this out of my system and I can get out of my way. Sister Drink, check this out. The, rich, the, the, the landowner, he goes back at 9 o'clock. He goes back at 12 o'clock. 
He goes back at 3 o'clock. So it's a drink, and then check this out. He goes back at 5, and he says, hey, why y'all still standing here? Why y'all still hanging around? They said, ain't nobody chose us. They don't see no value in us. They don't see what we bring to the table. They don't see how we can help out. They don't see what we can contribute to the family of God. They don't see the value in us. And God looks past them and says, I see the value in you. Going in my vineyard, I got you. I'll work some things out on your behalf. Look at what happens with the landowner. They say nobody has chosen us. He says, go in my vineyard. I, I, got, I started thinking about this text right here, Sister Drake, and I was wondering why were they still sitting there? So I had to go find one of them, April, and this is what they said when I found them. I said, hey, so why y'all still standing out there? They said, hey, well, we saw him come at 9. We saw him come at 6. We was out here at 6 in the morning. He picked everybody else, but he didn't pick us. Why y'all didn't leave? Because I would have quit. They said, well, we was going to quit. But then he showed up again at 9. And he picked the more people, but he didn't pick us. We was going to quit then. But then he came back at 12, and he showed up again. He picked some more folk. I was going to quit then, but then I noticed that he was still coming back. He came at 6, he came at 9, and then he came at 12, and then he came again at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We were going to quit, but we hung in there. Why didn't you quit? Because we understood that he wasn't done yet. And that's the word to somebody this morning that just called you waiting on God. God ain't done yet. He ain't through with you yet. Just because he ain't did it right now don't mean he ain't going to do it. God ain't done yet. I don't care what the doctor says. God ain't done yet. I don't care what the judge rules. God ain't done yet. It don't matter what the world says. God ain't done yet. Sometimes you can't give up so early. You can't quit when it seems like God ain't moving. You can't stop when it seems like you ain't getting an answer. God ain't done yet. Oh, can you trust him when you feel like the process ain't working? Can you hold on to him when it feels like your change ain't coming fast enough? God says, I want you to be able to trust me. He comes back at 5 o'clock. He picks them, and then... He pays them. Oh, he paid them a Daenerys, a whole day's wage for one hour worth of work. You ain't earn it. You didn't merit it. You didn't deserve it. But he gave it to you anyhow. As long as you got breath in your body, you need to learn to hold on and to trust in God. He's a way maker. He's a provider. A burden bearer, a heavy load sharer. He will keep you clothed in your right mind. He will make ways out of no ways. He's still Jehovah Jireh. He's still Jehovah Shalom. He's still your God. Is that how you really feel? Then trust in your God. May God bless you and may God keep you.